Hi, and welcome to Women's Health Conversations. I'm Denise Louie, and I'm joined today by Dr. Vonda Wright, the founder of Women's Health Conversations, and our very special guest, Dr. Nancy Yen Shipley. Um, before I turn it over to the two of them to have their conversation, uh, please know that this is a live recording, and you can ask questions of the doctors in either the chat section or the Q&A section of Zoom. So we look forward to hearing from you, and with that, I'll turn it over to the doctors. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I have been so excited about this Women's Health Conversation Speaker Series because I get to connect with so many people I've known over the years, but I also get to connect with people who I feel like I know, either because we have so many mutual friends or because I just follow them voraciously on social media. And Dr. Nancy Ann Shipley is one of those people. Hi, Dr. Nancy. Hi, how are you, Vonda? I'm so excited to connect with you. Finally, kind of face-to-face, -face, right? <laughs> kind of, kind of. I mean, we, we know mutual people. We are actually, for those of you listening, we are not only both orthopedic surgeons, but we're sports medicine docs. And so Nancy takes care of uh, the U.S. snowboard team and was bit, has been uh, deeply involved in that industry. And I take care of all kinds of Division I athletes from football to beach volleyball at this point, which is kind of fun. <laughs> so we share that in common. But the thing that we also share too, you know, we're practically sisters and I didn't even know it because <laughs> you went back to medical school uh, in your late twenties and so did I, right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. uh, we technically started orthopedic surgery late, but I don't feel like it was late. I, it was the right time for me to do it. And, and as you would, we'll get to this, our careers before influenced what we're doing today. Um, and we're both Renaissance people, which is something that you write about a lot. And so when I was following you online, um, I just saw the, uh, the breadth of the things that you've discovered in your own life and thought that there's probably a lot of people that would love to know how to do it all or maybe not do it all at one time. So, right. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. So, well, let's talk about that. You know, if you go on, on um, your website is nancymd.com. And if you go there, it talks a lot about uh, uh, developing, developing yourself as your own Renaissance person and harnessing your inner genius. So let's just go down that road and help people understand what you mean by that. I think that I started thinking about being a Renaissance woman when I began to write more and blog more. And I, I found that I had a lot of questions about how I ended up an orthopedic surgeon and as a woman, as a mom. And I thought about how the varied experience that I, experiences that I had had leading up into medicine and having had a different career and a whole bunch of different interests kind of all come together in this big melting pot that ends up being me. Yeah. And all of those different varied pieces pieces of experience, work, uh, just random interests that I have kind of all come together and create somebody who's multifaceted. And I encourage other people to, to not be a one trick pony and to really listen to themselves, their interests beyond just what their kind of day job is, because I think it all fits in to create this puzzle that's you. And if you draw from these different experiences, it enriches every single thing that you do. Give me an example of how um, some of your other interests make you better at your core job. You know, I say my day job, I am an orthopedic surgeon. I lead a department. That is my right. day job. How do your outside things inform what you probably spend most of your time doing um, and how I feed my family? But how, you know, how does... How, give me an example. Give us all an example. Well, even going back to when I was just a medical student, uh, because I had other experiences, uh, because I was a psych major, I had an interest in human psychology, uh, because I worked pre-medicine with people from all different backgrounds, ages, I was accustomed to talking to others that were not my peers. Mm -hmm. And so when that 
really became apparent that it was a, a, an advantage was when I started third year medical school. So for those listening that may, may not be familiar with how we progress through medical school, the first two years are um, mostly classwork. Um, you don't have a lot of interaction with patients, whereas when you're third year, fourth year, you are kind of the junior doctor. Yeah. And so when I started my third year rotations, I found that many of my peers, not all of them, but many of my peers who who had gone straight through, hadn't worked, they went straight from college into medical school, sometimes had a little bit of fear or anxiety or awkwardness talking to older people or people who just had different backgrounds than them. And I think that was a huge advantage having just a little bit of a different experience. And I drew from that to be able to connect with patients. And I think I still do today when I am talking to a patient. Uh, it, you know, I think that so much of orthopedic surgery is, is outside of the OR. It's, it's not yeah. just that. And you know that. We, yeah. we aren't just mechanics of the body. I mean, you know, though some of it has some overlap, right? Um, we, so much of the nuance of really being a good physician and a surgeon, I think happens in, in the clinic when you're talking to the patient before and after. And I think when you really draw on your, the rest of you and not just that technical surgeon part, it, it really helps you become a much better surgeon and a much better physician. I find, Nancy, that, and I'm the same way. I was a nurse before I went back to medical school, and I was a cancer nurse before I went. So there, that, I always say that I'm a much better doctor because I was a nurse first. And the intimacy yeah. of taking care of people in that critical time in their lives, because I don't know, frankly, I'm an, I might have been a jerk or something. I don't know what I would have turned out. <laughs> I doubt it. But you know what I mean? I would have been much less <laughs> empathetic. But and it informs my bedside manner now. I spend a lot of time teaching, as you probably do. I think it's interesting, and this is not a criticism of, of our peers, but I, I think that I find, uh, and maybe this is regional, that, that a lot of doctors choose to only be that technician. They have a lot mm -hmm. of PAs that see their patients ahead of time. And I have a PA, but there isn't that, you know, line them up, I'll do the, I'll do the surgery. And so mm -hmm. when I refer, and I'm wondering if you do this too, when I refer, I actually try to match my patient's personality with the person I'm referring. Absolutely. If, if they just need a technician, okay, I warn them, he's not going to talk to yes. you. Yes. Brilliant. If you need a, someone who will empathize and be your doctor, then you go to yep. this surgeon. Isn't that, yeah. so I, you do the same thing. I do right? that all the time. Yes. And I will, you know, and I can kind of sense and feel out the patient. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, you know, you're not going to do well with Dr. X because he is no BS. He is <laughs> not going to hold your hand. Yeah. He's just going to do what he thinks is best. And you're going to have a good result because he's, he's technically, technically very good, good yes. but he could, <laughs> but don't cry in his office because that won't fly. <laughs> That's right. You know, and, and my yeah. patients are allowed to cry in my office. It's okay. I understand. Yeah. And you know, this, the we're all the patients come to you in kind of their worst moments sometimes. And, um, but yeah, so I, I do will, I will kind of say, well, maybe you should go to this person and, and yeah. equally technically good, but just we'll take a little bit more time and we'll hold your hand a little bit. And right. I, I totally agree with you. We, we do do that. Well, and I think to bring us back to how our previous lives have informed our orthopedics lives and being Renaissance, I think it takes a little bit of, and I don't claim to be the biggest emotional quotient person, but I think it to be Renaissance, it does actually take an awareness of all the lanes and, yeah. and not such a, pinpoint granular focus that we can't see the forest for the trees or whatever it is. Right. 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 Yeah. And we have to be able to turn that on and off, you know, because yeah. that, that pinpoint laser focus has mm -hmm. to be there when we're operating. That's right. right. It, you mm -hmm. know, and I find that when I'm in there, it's like, <laughs> sometimes the people around me have changed shifts and I'm, I'm so focused on the surgery. I look up and my, my like, score is a different right. person. I was like, yeah. Oh, oh, when did you get here? You know, and, right. and which kind of speaks to how, how good they are in that yeah. it, it was such a seamless switch and they're still handing me exactly what I need. But I was like, yeah. oh, 
hello, I haven't seen you in a while. But yeah, That's so right. we need that laser focus at times, but then we need to switch that off also. That's it. It's, the OR is the only time when I'm OCD, like everything has to line <laughs> up. And in my own house, if you were yeah. to come visit me, it's not quite that organized. But well, <laughs> but let's talk about um, to, to be a truly Renaissance person, you have to accept that you have talent in a bunch of other areas. And I, is that what you mean when you're talking about harnessing your inner genius or to the level of your inner genius. Talk to me. Is that what you mean? Yes, I, that's exactly what it is. And I think that sometimes we, we don't give ourselves enough credit mm -hmm. and we have to recognize that we do have these inner talents and to yeah. not second guess ourselves. And secondly, I, I feel like sometimes there are these, these barriers that keep us from tapping into it because like of like second, it, you know, almost like a secondary gain. It's like what a fear of being too successful or too good at something because, you know, maybe my parents will be mad at me because they didn't get to do this. Or maybe, you know, and, and, and kind of these, these thoughts of being judged for achieving too much, too much success or feeling like you're not worth it or that you don't deserve it, you know? And I think uh, it, sometimes for many of us at some level, there's this, there's this fear that we'll, we'll do too well. And, and even, you know, and it, and, and I think even for me, it's like, it's, sometimes I have to let that go and be like, why am I, why am I procrastinating about something? Is it because I'm afraid mm. that someone will say yes to me and that I might actually make this big leap in my own personal development? And I think mm -hmm. I'm, I suffer from that all the time. And so, you know, I, when I write about things, it's, it's not because I'm an authority on something. It's not because I've figured it all out. It's because I'm going through it myself and I'm trying to learn for myself and writing is a little bit of my, my therapy. I like that perspective you just said, because when I write, I feel I, I'm, I, I've written a lot of books about fitness after 40. I started writing when I was 40 and I, and I have been fit. I'm not the most fit person in the whole world. Obviously, you're a Pelotoner. You, you know, Matt Wilpers is probably soon to most... be, soon to be. Oh, soon to be. <laughs> I get my bike Tuesday. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, you, those people are the fit. But sometimes, I mean, I totally get like, why am I writing this advice? Well, I do have a modicum of expertise in there. I have done a lot of research, but it's exploring yourself. And I love that you yeah. said that because they believe it or not, people listening and Within women doctor circles, there is a lot mm -hmm. of conversation, and I don't think it's just women doctors. We just happen to be on the same Facebook groups, but mm -hmm. a lot of conversation about imposter syndrome and faking yeah. it till you make it and, yeah. and wondering to ourselves and giving advice to younger doctors. It was just a whole stream. I don't know if you joined mm -hmm. in. A young doctor was talking about she got there, but she's feeling insecure about it. And why yeah. do we do that? I mean, I want to react by saying, listen, your board scores were high enough. Your interview is great mm -hmm. enough. You are worthy. You got there. And I want to cheer her on at the same time. I totally get it. How did yeah. I get into pit orthopedics, right? Or wherever we went. Why do we do that psychology major? <laughs> I think, you know, I mean, I, I think it's human nature, you know, I, I think that we are all prone to that and men and women both get it, but I think sometimes women uh, a little bit more and I myself has, have experienced it so often and still do. And, and I think part of why it's important to write about it and, and talk about it is because the people who may be five years behind us or 10 years behind us, either in medical school or, or residency or new physicians, uh, need to hear that other people are experience it, experiencing it even mm -hmm. years into practice and that it still happens. And, and when you hear that, it helps you. And when I talk about it and when I share the story of experience it, experiencing it still, it it makes me feel better to hear that my peers are, are also still there. And then, and then it helps me reset and kind of kick myself out of it, you know, but it, it's normal to kind of dip your toe into that imposter syndrome. And then the, the key I think is to find a mechanism to mm -hmm. yank yourself back out and be like, no, I actually deserve to be I here. Earned and this. Yeah. I earned this. Yeah, that's right. I was reading, um, 
I was reading this morning. I don't know if you know Sasha Shilkut. Do you know her? She's an anesthesiologist. I follow her. I think yeah. she's phenomenal. <laughs> you know, I mean, I was reading, I'm interviewing her coming up and, and I'm reading her book right now. And it was making me think of this this morning, this imposter syndrome, because mm -hmm. When I, I am to a point in my career, despite occasionally still doing this, what we're talking about, thinking I have nothing left to prove. I've gotten the job I needed. I'm making the money that I, I named the price. But yet, how do, we, how do we do the, okay, imposter syndrome, damn it, I've got nothing left to prove. But if I have nothing left to prove, I'm not dead yet. I mean, I've right. still got to do stuff. I mean, yeah. how do we put all these things together? I'm not good enough. I'm good enough, damn it. Uh, but I'm not dead yet. Shouldn't I still work harder? Well, you know, I think sometimes it, we, we get all those, those goals. We reach all those goals. It's like, yes, I have made it through medical school residency. Here I am in attending. I have made it. Yeah. And I have the house and I have my family and the kids. And, and I think it's, easy when you get to that point where if you don't keep challenging yourself and making yourself do things that you're kind of uneasy with or afraid of, mm -hmm. you get stagnant. You get stagnant. Yeah. I found myself there maybe two years ago and that's what prompted me to kind of get my, my social media platforms going and to write more and to create more content because there was something in me that just was like, I shouldn't be feeling unsettled, but I am. And I realized that I was starting to get into the routine. And it, it doesn't mean that I didn't love my work and, and doing yeah. the surgeries and my patients and taking care of them. It was all still very important, but I felt like I had fallen into a routine and it, it, things were just getting stagnant and I needed to push myself and to do something new. And so I, I think that's something we all need to do is ask yourself, have you done anything lately that kind of scares you? Yeah, right. Whether it's a physical thing, right? Maybe mm -hmm. you got to go run some more marathons or maybe you have to start a new venture or, you yeah. know, there's also a lot of doctor groups right now uh, talking about real estate and, you know, doing mm -hmm. something so weird outside of your, it doesn't mean you don't love your primary job. Absolutely. Right? It doesn't yeah. mean it. And so that's the mistake that I've, that's something that I've been mistaken for is um, we talked about this before we came live that sometimes when you harness your inner genius and you accept that you're a Renaissance person, mm -hmm. people will not get you. Yeah. And other surgeons, uh, and uh, if, for those of you who have never had surgery, most ORs are blue. Everything that's blue is sterile. So when I, mm -hmm. sometimes other peers won't get the renaissance-ness and you'll be criticized or, or say, well, you're not focused on your job because you're not focused only on the blue room. Right. And how have you overcome that or explained yourself to hospital administrators or whatever? They're like, saw you on social media. Why aren't you thinking about your patients? Or, <laughs> I don't know. You know, I, I have mostly, it is there. It's definitely there what you're speaking of and kind of that, that questioning of like, what what is it you're doing? And there are people that don't get it. But on the flip side, I've also had quite a bit of support. And, and um, I, I'm in private practice, but I, mm -hmm. I practice in a hospital system. And they've actually reached out to me to, to partner on some Facebook lives because they've said, oh, we, we really like what you're doing. You know, would you do That's something great. with us? And, and so I've, I've had mostly a positive response, even, even among the people who kind of look at me sideways. And, and I've actually had a neurosurgeon at my hospital say, you know what, we have got to sit and get coffee. I just, just want to know how you do this whole Instagram wow. thing. And like, I feel like I want to do that, but I don't even know where to get started. And so there's been some curiosity and it's, it's mm -hmm. mostly been positive, but I, I can definitely see how some people say, you know, can you just maybe just pick your thing and, and just do it. But, mm -hmm. but I mean, we're, we're, we're Renaissance women. We can't, right. That's right. <laughs> we have so many interests and so much more to offer. Yeah. Oh, and I'm so glad you've had a positive experience. Um, I've had mixed, honestly. And, mm -hmm. um, but the thing is, you have to know yourself. Someone else that we we're speaking yeah. to, Dr. Sheila Nazarian, we ended her conversation by talking about living your core values. And I think that's just Absolutely. what you said. Know yeah. who you are. Or if you don't know, figure it out. Step back. Yeah. Who am I and what is my core? 
and you just got to lift that or you'll feel unsettled. Like you said, like two years ago, yep. you're like, what is this I'm feeling? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. And, and I, I think about that a lot every now and then I'll, I'll look at what I'm involved in and what my obligations are. And I'll almost do an audit where I, I look oh, at all idea. the different roles mm -hmm. that I play and then I hold them up against my, my core values. And I do an assessment. I'm like, how, how much am I, how much is this obligation meeting this particular core value? And like, if mm -hmm. it's rating low, then I'm like, why am I why wasting am I my time doing that? this? Yeah. That's you right. Know, life I is too short. That's right. And there really is only a set amount of time. I got mm -hmm. the best advice about auditing from a when I was just coming out of my fellowship, there was a, a, a surgeon who was serving as a medical director for Pfizer who, who had been kind enough to do some work with me. And his name is Dr. Mike McGee. And I asked him, so what's your last advice? I'm about to go out and practice. And he basically said that. He said, listen, Vonda, figure out where you want to be in five years, maybe 10 years. He's asking me mm -hmm. to evaluate my, what my core value as a surgeon or a worker was going to be. And he says, everything you're asked to do by other people, you mm -hmm. have to evaluate it against that goal. And if it doesn't yeah. align, you have to say yeah. no. Yeah. Yeah. So that's a really important thing, especially people coming up in their careers. But you know what? I want to get to something that's really important and that you're really working on in a big way uh, right now. And it's your new podcast. And it's yes, the soft <laughs> title is The Sixth Percent. Because yes. you are interviewing women in professions that are predominantly men, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. So I got this inspiration a while back. I was flying and going through an airport. I saw a woman who was a captain, commercial airline pilot, mm -hmm. and I wanted to go up to her and be like, Hey, we probably experienced some of the same things as, right. going, as I was going through residency. And um, I just wanted to sit down and like grab a drink with her and, and pick her brain, you know, and of course I kept walking, but I almost wanted to like give her a, what's up? Like, I know, <laughs> I know what you went through. Yeah, <laughs> I yeah. went through it too. That's and, right. um, and I've been thinking about that for a long time. And when, it, you know, the, the COVID thing started to happen and it became apparent that this was going to really change everybody's lives. You know, I think I, like a number of other people for a little bit of time went into this shutdown mode where mm -hmm. I'm like, okay, I'm not, I'm not operating. I can't, and I shouldn't, right? Because, because we need to stop elective procedures. We have right. to shut everything down. Yep. And I was fearful for our family, our health. My, my husband's a critical care and pulmonary physician. Um, mm -hmm. So he's on the front lines, um, worried about my son's education. I mean, just worrying yes. about everything, worrying about the world, you know, and what's going to happen to, to public health and our economy. So I was really bogged down and I kind of personally shut down for a little while. And then I realized, you know what, I really, you know, selfishly need something to keep me going. And that's when I decided to turn it on high gear and really make the podcast happen. I'd just been thinking about it. Um, but then I was like, you know what, now's the time. I'm, I actually have some time. And as I reached out to these amazing women in these varied fields, it turned out they had time too. Oh. So I mean, like... <laughs> You know, and so uh, there are these CEOs and, and somebody in uh, Major League Baseball, a woman who's one of the first full-time Major League Baseball hitting coaches. I reach, I said, you know what? The worst that could happen is they'll That's tell me no, they don't have time, right? Yeah. And so yeah. I just started reaching out to people. And, and amazingly, so many women were very responsive and very interested in coming on the show. And they said, well, you know, my season's on hold. And so I have time. Want to talk tomorrow? And I, I'm, my mind was blown. I was like, yeah. I, I can't even believe that I'm getting to talk to these badasses. They're just amazing people. Maybe that's um, what you so should call I'm the, thrilled. maybe that's what you should call them. Badasses. <laughs> badasses. But I, I wanted to show, I told you I wanted to show some pictures and then I want to return yeah. I want to hear some of the stories you've heard. But this, I want you guys to see what Dr. Nancy and I have lived. I mean, if you guys are yeah. in a, a male dominant uh, 
field, you'll get it, but they're probably mm -hmm. teachers and people in regular professions. So I'm going to share, share my screen real quick and just show everybody what I'm talking about. So technically, here we go. So here we go. Can you see, Nancy? Yeah, I screen? can see it. This yep. is this is a uh, in my old department at the University of Pittsburgh. We used to have visiting professors, and this is a visiting professor dinner. And this is typical, right? There are 15 yep. picked people in this picture. Me, mm -hmm. this woman is a fellow of mine. But this is how we live, and we're fine with it. I people think when I talk about uh, the six percent or whatever we are now that it means mm -hmm. that I don't like men. I love men, and I love my colleagues. It's just that this is the world we live in. And it always shocks yeah. people when they actually mm -hmm. see it. This is a picture and we opened a new sports center and these are all the executives that I work with. And there I am again, me and all the executives, all the guys, all the, guys <laughs> the CEO of the company, the athletes. So, mm -hmm. but thankfully, uh, thankfully, this is becoming more normal for us, right? The top half of, uh, of the slide actually I was so fortunate to train with seven women, which was unheard of. Yeah. And uh, this one on the end was the senior uh, uh, person of all of us. And her advice was, don't cry, don't ask to leave early, and don't date the men. So <laughs> and then, this is a picture of, of the residents, some of them right before I left University of Pittsburgh. We actually had 14 this women. This is residents. awesome. It's awesome. And what we were doing in this picture, uh, I had been asked to be in a magazine and I said, I'm not going in alone, but if you let me bring the women surgeons we're training, I'll do it. And so I love it. hair, makeup, they're all dolled up. They're badasses, right? Yes. Don't you that love is that? really cool. I totally <laughs> love that. And, you know, and it makes me think of a couple of things. Um, I, I, you know, a lot of times I'll tell people what I do. And for those uh, who I talk to who know that it's typically, you know, a, a you know tall buff white male who's yeah. an orthopedic surgeon That's right they go you you don't look like an orthopedic surgeon and i think that that as women surgeons we have to reconcile that we can be really good technically we can have good bedside manner and be these phenomenal surgeons but we can wear what we want have our hair how we want go get our nails done you know and and do the things that maybe are are considered more feminine and and that's just a part of who we are and not be apologetic for it you know like we shouldn't mm -hmm. be sorry for wanting like you know shiny pretty shoes if that's what we're into and not everybody's into that but you know it we kind of have to own who we are as individuals mm -hmm. and and be okay with kind of not looking like a surgeon and maybe changing what people's perception is of what a surgeon should look like yeah, I love that because when people say that to me, I mean, the last hip I reduced as a resident was, and I was about the size I am now, uh, he was a 350 pound drunk guy, right? I just climbed on the bed. He was asleep. <laughs> I it's technique, people. It is skill yeah. and technique. It is a little finesse. It's a little finesse <laughs> and we get this job done. But and, you know, and I don't know about you, I'm a little crazy, but I feel empowered when I wear high heels and red lipstick. I wear lipstick under my mask. It sometimes ends up all <laughs> over the place, but you got to be who you are at exactly. all times. You have to be comfortable yeah. in your own skin. But tell me some of the stories you've heard from these women on your new podcast coming out. So it's going to be coming out next month and I, yeah. I am titling it the 6%, but this is kind of the soft announcement of the title because I hadn't really publicly talked about it yet. So I'm really uh -oh. proud of it. Oh, yeah. No. And, and this was, it was intended to be the soft launch. I was like, I'm oh, going to tell the world That's on women's it. health conversations. <laughs> and so excited to, to announce that. Um, but I have had the opportunity and the honor to talk to um, the first female chief of police. Um, she is 78 now wow, and retired, wow. but wow, I mean, what a firecracker. And she, the stories that she told, I like, we think we have some challenges now being in a male dominated field. Wow. Like in the sixties and seventies, that mm -hmm. was interesting. Mm -hmm. It was really interesting. So I got to talk to her and I have talked to a group of women venture capitalists because a lot of times, uh, you know, VC is very strongly biased mm -hmm. towards male founded businesses. And so mm -hmm. I'm, I'm so excited to have that 
episode come out, movie producers, directors. I talked to, and this will be um, in the first season uh, coming out next month. I talked to the first full-time Major League Baseball hitting coach, Rachel wow. Balkovac, yeah. and she had some great stories. Um, in fact, like one of my favorite quotes, I've been kind of saving good quotes from each of my episodes. And one of my favorite quotes is hers. And it was directed towards women in male dominated fields. It was just put the toilet seat down. I love it. Like I, I want to make a t-shirt and like give it to all my girlfriends because it, her, her story was that, you know, Imagine you're a woman, you live in a house full of men and you have some boys and, and you, you go to the bathroom and the toilet seats up and you tell them again and again, it's like, please put the toilet seat down. Is it because they hate you? Is it because they want it? They have it out for you? No, they just didn't think about it. And sometimes in the course of being in a male dominated field, you know, you kind of just, you just put the toilet seat down, you pee and you move on. Move right? on right. It's, it's a little bit about picking the battles and knowing, knowing what to fight for and what to just be like, you know what, this is a little one. We can move on and we have bigger work to do. That's it. I love that. I love, I encounter that every day, by the way, but I love- <laughs> in a house full of boys, house, exactly. You just put, you, you, got, you got to pee. Yeah. So you can put the just toilet go. seat down. Just go. I love it. Yeah. Well, I cannot wait. And and when you are, uh, when it's all listed, I'm sure it's going to be on Apple and YouTube yep. and wherever all the, uh, we'll, anna- we'll send an email out to everybody and announce it because awesome. I can't wait to listen to it myself. It'll be, It'll be great. Fun. <laughs> well, I'm going to bring Denise uh, Louie back, who is uh, co-hosting with me, and she has questions to ask you. Hello, Denise. Hello. <laughs> Hello. Oh, I love the conversation you guys have had. So, and, and a reminder for the folks who are joining us online, you can tee up your questions. We'll be sure to, to raise those as well. So I know one of the questions I want to ask you, and you guys chatted about this a little bit, but you both went you know, back to school <laughs> to something mm-hmm. significant, and then she went back to medical school a little oh, bit later in life. We didn't choose and, a and not, Right, and not just right. any old, yeah, you chose orthopedics <laughs> at that. Right. But like, what, what was going through your mind? What, what compelled you to do that then? And, I'm, and the reason I'm asking this is what advice would you give to the women um, who, or men for that matter, who are saying, you know, I'm just a little bit too old to be going back to school. I don't really like what I'm doing, but I want to do it. So what, what compelled you to do that? Well, I was about six years out when I went back to medical school. I was almost 30. Um, I am, I, I'm your classic late bloomer. You know, here I am in like my 40s getting onto social media. And so, you know, that's just, <laughs> it must be my MO. But I went through college. I didn't really know what I wanted to do. I started out thinking that I was going to be pre-med for totally the wrong reasons. I, I you know, because I'm, I, I'm a good Chinese American daughter and I think my parents wanted me a doctor wanted me to be a doctor and so I, I thought I was going to be pre-med but I graduated with uh you know I got weeded out of the pre-med curriculum graduated with 2.9999 which I will round up to a three um and I just didn't know what I wanted to do and as I was exploring different things after college I was in the snowboard industry I I ran events for um, one of my family members and kind of helped run their small business um organized conferences, I realized, I got to a point where I was like, you know, what, what do I have for me? I'm working for somebody else and I need to do something for myself. And I was exposed during that last job to actually the, the Chinese medicine side of things, acupuncture, and it was very intriguing. But then I said, you know what, that is one piece of the picture. I did a little bit of acupuncture training and I still, I, I love that part of my life, but I was like, this is one piece of taking care of the human body. And there's mm-hmm. there. And so I kind of came back full circle and I decided to apply to medical school at that point. Wow. So here's a question for you. I'm wondering if the folks who, you know, struggle with what they want to do with their life, do you see a correlation between those individuals being a Renaissance person? And so they, they want to learn more, they want to try more. What's been your experience with that? I think that when you really embrace that part of you, that's the Renaissance person, you kind of learn to gain skills from all your different experiences. And then you also step back and think about what, like we were talking about earlier, what your values are, that can kind of help you hone in on what's important to you as well as what you're good at. 
And I really like thinking about the concept of um, Ikigai. And of course, I'm like on the spot right now. And I hope I remember all four things. But you kind of look at the different pieces of, of what the world needs, what you're good at, um, what can make you money, right? What can earn you a living. Mm-hmm. And you put all those things together to figure out what, what, you know, what you're meant to do on this earth. And, and, and that what could change every couple of years as you morph and as you grow. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah. Because, right. Cause you know, social media, was that really a, that big of a thing? Even 10 years ago, it was really becoming a thing. So I don't know that you're late to the game, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. I mean, you're just, you're, you're taking a look at the world around you and saying, Oh yeah, I can fold that into what I'm doing. Absolutely. So, okay. So here's another question that um, intrigued me. So, being a renaissance person yes you have your um you you guys talked about the blue rooms and this thought popped into my head um that okay yeah you guys deal with the blue room but like being renaissance women you work with all colors of the rainbow it's not just the blue (laughs) but anyway (laughs) but how do you develop the laser focus that you need to have for the blue room what sort of um, techniques do you draw upon to help you concentrate to that degree you know, I, and, and like, I'm curious what Vonda thinks about this and if she has the same experience, but for me, I, it wasn't anything that I had to say I need to develop. I think when we start medical school, people sort of self-select into surgical versus non-surgical. And when you go into the, when you select into more of a surgical personality, it's, it's almost like it's just, it, <laughs> this is a total pun, but it's in your bones, right? Uh-huh. And, <laughs> you know, it's, it, it, it was never something where I walked into the OR and I said, okay, I got to focus. I got to figure out how to be better at focusing. It was like I walked into the OR and it was like, Whoa. and it just, it just happens. And, and I think that's why we're surgeons. What do you, what do you think, Vonda? Is that true for you? Yeah, you know, it, uh, that is exactly the answer I get. They're like, why did you become a surgeon? And, and I say that in medical school, it becomes clear in very quickly who are the medicine yeah. doctors and who are the surgeons. Medicine doctors round all day long. They <laughs> gather huge amounts of data. They, pro- yes. they chew on it. They write their note at 4 p.m. Surgeons. God bless them. <laughs> God bless them. I could not do it. Thank you for <laughs> yes. that. And I say that. Thank God they do that because I. Yes. Do that. I gather the yeah. same amount of information. I process it. I write the note. We make the orders. We're in the OR by seven fifteen. We just. Yep. It's just we think differently. But the mm-hmm. other way that that once I'm, you know, that's how we get to where we are. It's in us. It's in our bones. But on a daily basis. And you know, every time I'm operating in a new OR, I, tr- I am constantly trying to get people to understand that surgery is a rhythm and I need mm-hmm. a rhythm and a ceremony. And it's not that I'm being picky, but it matters the rhythm. And even, I don't know about you, Nancy, but the, when I'm, everything has been done and the last thing I have to do is go to the scrub tech, get my gown on, get my two pairs of gloves on. We do the little spin thing. That mm-hmm. is all ceremony that slowed yes. out, slows down time for me. And by yeah. the time I turn from the scrub table to my OR table, I am mm-hmm. there. Mm-hmm. And it's the ceremony that ceremonies are important. Um, I don't know. That's how I focus in the moment actually. Right. It's almost like there's that, there's that body muscle memory, right? When you, when you go through those actions, it sort of sets your brain up uh, completely unconsciously where you you know, you do the turn, you tie the knot and then it's like, boom, you're ready Gone. to go. Ready. Mm-hmm. That's right. Wow. Cool. Um, <clears throat> let's see here. Um, why do you, I want to probe a little bit more why it is that we we believe we fear success. Why, why, why are we so afraid of going above and beyond? I know we talked about that a little bit, but I just wanted to probe that a little bit more. I mean, it may be from the conversations that you have had uh, with these 6% women, you know, why is that? I, I think that we, we are victim to fearing what other people think. Um, and, and then some of it also goes back to just what 
we experienced in our childhood or our upbringing and like our parents' attitudes towards success or money or whatever. And it, it just gets deeply implanted. But, but you know, I, I think on a day-to-day -day basis, sometimes we're afraid of like, well, what if I do do this? What, uh, you know, what's so-and-so going to think? Whether it's family, friends, coworkers, or whatever. Like Vonda and I were talking about, you know, getting on social media and kind of doing things like this. It's, you know, some of our, our, colleagues in ortho are like well what's that all about you know and I, and and it's human nature to to care um but i think it takes a little bit of retraining to teach ourselves that that you can control what you think you can control what you feel you cannot control what everybody else thinks they're right. going to think what they're going to think and i think when you bring bring that into the mix and you remind yourself it helps it helps you say okay well then this is important to me this is part of my core values i'm going to push myself to you know succeed in x y and z and and that helps you get over that hump yeah it's almost as if and particularly um, women who are being trailblazers it's it's that stepping out into that unknown and being different from your tribe in many respects right like i that's yeah. what i'm kind of hearing you say so that that's you, a interesting perspective right you know yeah and you know it just made me think of something that that i had encountered at the beginning of of the pandemic and kind of shutting everything down And is like, he's like, you know, yeah, I think this needs to happen. I don't want to be the last one, but I also don't want to be the first. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and so it relates a little bit to the question that you're asking. It's like, I, you know, what are people going to think if I'm the first one to pull the plug on electric elective surgeries? Yeah. Yeah. It's that separating yourself from your tribe and being that trailblazer. Maybe that's yeah. the heart of it right there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, what is, uh, besides your own podcast, what's your favorite podcast or app that you find that um, supports your life as a Renaissance woman? Oh, gosh, there are so many. Um, I'm, I'm a little bit, you know, I'm a podcast kind of uh, browser, and I, I don't always stick to one, and I kind of jump around. But, it, it, you know, one of the bigger ones, uh, more mainstream ones is uh, is it how I built this? Yeah, it's called oh, how I I, the, the one. NPR one. Um, yeah. How I built this because mm -hmm. it just you know you look at these people that are have built these amazing uh, organizations and companies, and even though they're not they're not medicine, you know they're in varied fields. I love hearing these origin stories, and mm -hmm. and I like hearing about how people have fallen and how they've gotten back up because I think that's really important is to not be afraid of failure. And know that failure is out there, and that there's a lesson to be learned when you when you try for something and you don't succeed, um, and then the the grit and the gumption that you need to get back up from that. Yeah, that's awesome. Oh wow. Um, let me ask a little bit about your writing. Okay, so I understand that you blog, and I've been out to your website, and I see and I see your blog. When did you start doing that? Did you do it before you officially? began the blogging? I mean, is this an ancient history there for you for, for writing, like from when you were very young or when did that start? You know, it's funny. Um, I started blogging maybe two or three years ago and uh, I started out writing informational pieces that may be of interest to my patients. And I still do that. I still write about bone and joint health, but I found that when I branched out and I wrote about my path to medicine and what it's like being a mom and kind of the whole Renaissance woman thing, that that got the most traction and the most interest. And so I really started to write more um, in that arena. And it, it, it didn't even occur to me until pretty recently, actually, that I was like, oh, I forgot. When I was 13, I was in junior high. I wanted to be a writer. I, that was one of my, one of my careers. I was like, what, what are you going to do when you grow up? I'm going to be a writer. And I rediscovered that love of writing recently. And it was something I had lost. 
I think I had lost it for a good amount of my adult life. So it's been really cool to, to kind of reactivate the writing juices. <laughs> yeah, to come full circle with that. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, again, and that's, that sounds just like a Renaissance person to do, right? To call <laughs> upon all, all of the, the tools in your toolbox, right? Oh my goodness. That's right. Um, okay, let's see. Just double check in uh, questions online there too. Um, well, Nancy, I love that you dug even deeper in your toolbox and played the piano again. <laughs> <laughs> that's a little embarrassing i yeah i posted this on on my my page and um on my instagram i think and uh, i haven't played piano for many decades i can't even read music anymore it's really sad i, I all those piano lessons gone that's to waste right. but my <laughs> my son wanted to hear the theme to the mandalorian we just got a new little digital piano so he could start lessons and i was like Hmm, let me YouTube that and I'll figure it out. And I was like, it's got a little bit left in me still. That's so great. That's great. Okay. So what has surprised you the most about your Renaissance life so far? Oh gosh, that's a hard one. What has surprised me the most? Um, I think when I started to the couple of times, many times where I've just taken a leap of faith, not knowing that I would succeed, um, that I did succeed, like deciding to go to medical school. Mm -hmm. um, and it's almost like I, I've taken this leap of faith. I've been surprised. I'm like, oh, I got in. And then the imposter syndrome hits. It's like, right. that's what happens, right? Because yeah. you say, I'm going to, it's, it's this push and pull where you, you make yourself do something. It's like you, you make yourself dive off that diving board into that cold water. You know, it's going to be cold. Um, and then you land and you're like, hey, I did it. And then I'm like, ooh, what am I doing here? It's, <laughs> it, you know, that happens over and over again. <laughs> but it's just surprised that, you know, every time I decide to go for it, that either I actually succeed or I don't succeed, but I've learned something from it. So there's always something to gain from taking that chance. Right. There, that reminds me of a quote, and I don't remember who had said it, but, you know, there along the lines of taking that chance we're we're actually more powerful than we ever realized and we need yeah. to remember that right mm -hmm. yeah, okay absolutely so final, final question for you what advice would you give your younger self well gosh i think there are kind of a couple different realms of my life that i would give uh, advice on to my younger self but you know maybe number one it takes a village you know mm -hmm. we're not on an island it takes good friends, good support. You need a good support system. You need people to be able to call when you've had a bad day and you want to just cry on their shoulder. Um, you know, assemble your tribe. Make sure you know who your tribe is, know who's in it, know who's not. Um, I think all of that is important. And I, I think that, you know, having, staying organized, having a good, good system to, take away some of the the effort of you know kind of automating some parts mm -hmm. of your life I think are important and that'll you know that'll make life a lot easier um, and just be prepared to fall sometimes and just be okay with knowing that you're you know you you might have failed at something but there's more out there for you and that you can get back up and you could do it right Reminds, now there's a, isn't it a Chinese proverb, fall seven times, get up eight? <laughs> I love that. <laughs> <laughs> well, Dr. Nancy Yen Shipley, thank you for taking an thank hour you. with us today. I'm really excited uh, about the launch of your podcast. And thank I'm so you. glad to finally meet you after knowing you on social media. So thank you Same again Same here. Today. I do feel like we're, we're twins separated at birth. In oh, many seriously, ways. <laughs> I know, I know. So, well, I look forward to seeing you in person in the future and uh, thanks again. All right. Bye-bye everybody. Best wishes. Have a great day.